Hello, and thank you for joining me here today. I'm Deb Calvert, and this is the People First Productivity Solutions and Deb Calvert channel on Bright Talk. Um, for anyone who is not familiar with Bright Talk, let me just point out a couple of things really quickly. First of all, if you have any technical difficulties at all, please press the orange button, the one that says Get Live Support Now. That'll take you to the tech team at Bright Talk, and they're really great. They'll, they'll help you out right away. If you have any questions for me throughout the presentation, please post those as, as your questions come up. I'll try to fold my answers in uh, in a natural sequence as we proceed, and I'll, I'll try to leave time at the end for questions too. But if we don't get to your question or if something comes up later or you happen to be somebody who's listening on demand, don't ever hesitate to be in touch with me. I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn, and I've given you my email address there in the, the notes from uh, the presenter. So it's an open door. Uh, let me know if there's something I can help with. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, um, one of the things I like best about Bright Talk is that they give us an opportunity to provide bonus content for you. So there's a tab that you'll see called Attachments and Links, and when you drop that down, it gives you a lot of stuff. One of the first things I've put in there for you is I, I made a handout of today's slides because I know some people like to print those and take notes as they go along. Feel free to download that at any point. Uh, I also gave you a link directly to my LinkedIn profile so that we can connect. And I always appreciate when people do that during these presentations or after. Um, I, I am, I'm Deb Calvert, and I've uh, been in a Fortune 500 company in an HR function. I've also been in sales and operations functions throughout my career, and I've been in business for, with People First Productivity Solutions uh, for 14 years. We build organizational strength by putting people first. We are useful in any of the people parts of the business, and some of the content that I have is really meant just for people in any division, in any role. Today's topic is an example of that. It's about being assertive and influential, and it's for anyone in any part of the business. Well, okay, that's enough about me. I know what you came for. Let's go ahead and jump into our topic. We are talking about a topic today that sometimes is a little um, sensitive. I think people often feel vulnerable about topics like this. And it's one of the reasons I, I chose this topic is because it's not something that there are a lot of great resources out there for. Uh, so let me be that resource for you today. Uh, we're going to talk about the differences between being passive, and we'll certainly talk about what's happening when people are more passive than they are assertive. And then we're going to talk about this other extreme of being aggressive, because sometimes that gets confused with or misunderstood. People who aren't assertive sometimes aren't assertive in situations because they are afraid they'll come across as aggressive. So I, I want to start off by defining assertiveness. And I think the right place to start is by drawing this distinction, making this comparison between assertive and aggressive. By drawing this kind of a contrast like you see on screen, um, we're going we're gonna to flush out the ways that, that some leaders overextend. Some people overextend themselves. They assert themselves so much that they crowd out others, and, and they make it uncomfortable for other people to assert themselves too. And then in this presentation, I also hope we're going to get to answer some other questions like, well, why, why does this matter? It sounds good being assertive, but why does that really matter? And why is it important for people in all different levels, not just senior leaders, but leaders at every level, why does it matter to assert yourself? Why is that important? And we'll take it up a notch too. Why is it important for leaders not only to assert themselves, but to also enable others to assert themselves too, rather than overextending their own assertiveness? Now, yeah, I'm using the word leaders, and I'm going to keep using that word. I, I do want to just uh, take a, a, a little bit of a tangent here because some of you may not have heard enough of my presentations in the past to know what I mean when I say leader. I, I operate from a belief that you can be a leader at any level, and in fact, know it or not, like it or not, 
you already are a leader. People are following you. They're, they're paying attention to what you say and do. And when you know that you're a leader, when you liberate the leader inside yourself, when you position yourself as a leader, you become a lot more effective. So it goes hand in hand with being assertive. Part of it is in how you see yourself. And I'm going to use the word leader not for any sort of hierarchy or job title distinction, but because, well, that's how I want you to see yourself as we talk about assertiveness. So let me keep on defining it. Now that we've defined leader, let's just get back to the definition of assertiveness. I'm going to read this to you because I think there's a lot to unpack here. Assertiveness. The, the practice of assertiveness is being authentic in our dealings with others, treating our values and persons with decent respect in social contexts, refusing to fake the reality of who we are or what we esteem in order to avoid disapproval, the willingness to stand up for ourselves and our ideas in appropriate ways, in appropriate contexts. So there's a lot there. Please note that assertiveness is not about putting on an artificial face to be something that you're not. I see this happen a lot in business. For, for introverts, for example, who are told that they should be more assertive, well, that directive alone can cause a lot of discomfort. It signals that there's some sort of a forced need to speak up. And what usually happens then is that someone who feels under the gun, they, the pressure to speak up, typically they just voice false agreement rather than offering their true opinions because they haven't had time to process their true opinions and to formulate what they want to say. The easier thing to do to speak up in a meeting, for example, is to give agreement even when you don't fully feel that way. Well, instead of that, assertiveness is about developing the ability to state your needs, to say what you need. I need time to think about this, for example. And then to be fully present and highly engaged in discussions in a way that's natural for you. When people are holding back, it is often due to a a fear of criticism or conflict or a concern about how others will believe them. And frankly, some people feel that they have no right to impose their views on the world or on the people who are in the meeting. Being visible, uh, having a contrary opinion, expressing their own needs and wishes, right? these are things that make some of us at times feel vulnerable. And in those moments, we hold back. We go along with other people's suggestions. We say yes, even if we really want to say no. And we work hard to pacify other people. When this is going on, the person who's not asserting their own needs, what's really going on is that they're mirroring others. They're reflecting back the hopes and wishes, desires, plans of, of other people more than they're radiating out their own goals and thoughts and dreams. And by doing that, without realizing it, you might be limiting yourself. You might be limiting other members of your team. You might even be limiting the person you are mirroring because you're not giving them something new. You're only giving them a reflection of what they already have. By not fully contributing, you're missing out on an opportunity to enhance what's happening for everyone. Okay, now there are other people who take a completely different approach. They feel a strong need to impose their views on everybody around them. And they want their way to be accepted by everyone else. And they're willing, they're, they're happy. They, they might even like to fight for their ideas. And if other people don't give in, sometimes those folks appear to be angry. Uh, they might use a louder voice. They might magnify their stance to, to dominate or intimidate others. And I'm not even saying that's intentional. It, it's just how some people present themselves. And oftentimes when people are given positions of authority, this is what they think they're supposed to do to be in charge. Uh, but I think that's somewhat of a misunderstanding. It's an overextension. So 
for people who are forcing their wishes upon others, even accidentally, what I'd want them to know is that if they're ignoring or even trampling on the wishes that could have been expressed by others, this too is self-limiting. See, neither of the, the extremes is entirely effective. And I get it. I get that it feels good in the moment because it, it has the desired effect of either avoiding conflict or uh, of getting one's own way. But in neither case does it position you to be as effective as you could be. So I'm going to give you a graphic. This is a lot to take in. I'll leave it on screen for a nice long time. And don't forget, I put the slides in an attachment for you, so you can download this if you like it. What I've attempted to illustrate here is a continuum, left to right, of assertiveness. And to show you where people who are leading others, by title or otherwise, where we as leaders sometimes go astray. So you see four columns across the top, passive, independent, assertive, and aggressive. That's the continuum. I've broken up assertive into two. The two middle columns are independent and assertive because, frankly, I see people get these confused quite often, and they just boil down to a choice. I'll talk more about that choice in a minute, but, but please know that this is a continuum. And then what you see on the rows over there on the left, uh, these are six ways you can evaluate yourself and determine if your behavior indicates that you are passive, independent, assertive, or maybe even aggressive. I think this is going to be easier if you think about a project or um, an initiative or any responsibility that you're working on right now. And as you're thinking about that, especially a, a project or an, an initiative that involves other people, as you're thinking about that, you can self-assess and you can identify any of your behaviors that don't fall into this green column. I'm going to start by talking about that one. Remember, I said you get to choose. It's sometimes valid to be in this column, the, the uh, one that's labeled independent. But you want to watch out for accidentally being in the passive or the aggressive columns. Think about the level of control that you have and, and that you show to others. Think about the level of knowledge that you bring into a meeting. Uh, think about the support that you offer and ask for. Think about how you feel, too, because your feelings will drive a lot of your outward behaviors. So think about your confidence. Think about your abilities. Think about what happens when you need to solve a problem in that situation. Okay, now what I'd also like to do, you're thinking about yourself, you're doing some self-assessment. What I'd also like you to do is I'd like you to think about someone, anyone, who you've worked with in the past who exhibited behaviors over here in this pinkish column, the far right-hand column. And as you think about people who have behaved this way, we all know someone who has, as you think about those behaviors and those attitudes, I'd like you to to really reflect on how those behaviors and attitudes took away from that person's effectiveness long term. Sure, they might have been able to dominate or intimidate somebody in the moment, but how did that really serve them long term? Or they might have taken something over or done their own thing and offered no help to others. Maybe they would have held information Maybe they were pushy. Any of those words that you see, they, they all have a negative connotation. That's by intention because this is how they end up being perceived. When people are perceived in these ways, even if they get what they want in that moment, there is a long-term consequence, a price to pay because of the way we see those folks, the ways that we choose to maybe even avoid those folks in the future. So in this continuum, being over there in the right-hand column, that represents going too far. And we could probably spend a whole other webinar on why people end up over in that column. I tend to think, and I see a lot in my executive coaching, that it's because, frankly, those people are kind of overcompensating. They're not as confident as they're trying to come across. They, they have some vulnerability, and they use the behaviors to mask some of those issues. So unpacking and, and getting to those root causes, that's uh, how you help people not to be over there. Okay, now let's, let's come to the opposite side. Let's talk about this purple box labeled passive. A lot of people end up here 
sometimes in response to someone else who's very aggressive, people choose just to stay in their lane and, and to opt out and not lock horns with that person. But think about the ways you perceive people who show up like this, the ones who seem really insecure, the ones who put in their, their abilities as being inadequate, the ones who are too afraid to take little risks and solve problems, the ones that seem helpless. If you know and have seen people like that in the past, you know that you also have um, a reaction to them. Sure, maybe it suits their needs at the moment. They don't have to take a risk or put their neck out. They can get other people to tell them exactly what to do. They don't have to offer ideas. In the moment, maybe that feels good. But long term, the people who do that end up being perceived and that it's not likely to get them where they want to go. So that leaves us with the two boxes in the middle. Now, I give you these two options because you can select whichever one is right for you, and that be situational. But I would encourage you not to pick the one that's just easy or comfortable for you, and you shouldn't necessarily pick the one that others expect from you so you don't have to leap right into the one called assertive uh, because that's the one that is most often associated with healthy, strong leadership but maybe it's not the one that's right for you in a given situation. I I want you to have two choices between the independent and the assertive column. When you know which is going to meet your goals, when you know which behaviors and choices you can make will get you to the place you want to go, that's how you ought to use your choices. So sure, it's it's good. And if you've been a frontline contributor, maybe even a manager who's been rewarded for being highly independent, you might find yourself kind of locked into this box. You're pretty self-reliant. You make a point to be informed. You stay in control of things. And that works for you. These are valid choices. But I just want to offer up that being assertive in a way that gets your needs met, as well as getting the needs of other people met, there are options that you have to meet your needs and to get the needs met of other people, maybe people who need some development opportunity, or maybe people that you're trying to negotiate with, to be able to share, that means giving up a little bit of it, Um, to be helpful to people as opposed to being self-reliant and expecting others to be self-reliant too. These choices are the behaviors that cause others to see you as strong and assertive. So it's up to you to pick which one makes sense for you. Okay, I had a lot of people who came in since the beginning, so I just want to do a little bit of a refresher here. Please post questions as they come up. I'm, I'm happy to answer those as, as we go through the, the presentation, and I'll also leave some time at the end. Uh, and there are other attachments that are available to you, like the slides from this presentation, if you like to download them and, and take notes. Okay, so we've defined assertiveness, I've given you some contrast, and now I want to make a strong case, if I can, for being more assertive more often. See, when when you're assertive, it allows you to relate to others with less conflict and less anxiety and less resentment. Being assertive, even if it's a habit that you have to develop and initially it's uncomfortable, when you are able to be assertive, it allows you to be more relaxed around others because you know that you'll be able to handle most situations reasonably well. Being assertive helps us to focus on the present situation rather than allowing that present communication to be contaminated by old resentments or unrealistic fears. And when you're assertive, you get your self-respect intact without trampling on the self-respect of others. So by allowing others to express their opinions, we also gain their respect in that way. Now, our, our, self, our own self-confidence, right, that, that also gets boosted by being more assertive. If you can reduce your attempts to constantly gain favor with others, and if you can rely less on others' approval, then You get to discover and express your own self. And that is so liberating. And it builds confidence. It's it's circular. 
You'll continue to build confidence as you're more assertive, and as you're more assertive, you'll become more confident, and you'll be able to do more of all of that in the future, that showing up in a confident way, being able to lead others, gaining others' respect, being more assertive. It, it all multiplies. Being assertive, not aggressive, but assertive, acknowledges that others have the right to do the same thing, to live their lives with their opinions and values and choices being fully expressed. We, we don't try to control them. So now we're not breeding any resentment. We're not having any false acquiescence essence from them. They're not just deferential to you, but their needs are being met. And they appreciate that you've respected and dignified their needs too. That triggers the law of reciprocity. Because you have dignified and respected and hurt others, they want to do the same for you. So here again, we have this multiplier, this circular effect. And overall, when you add it all up, overall, when you're assertive, you gain control of your own life and you reduce any feelings of helplessness that come with being passive and you build relationships with others that are both fully participatory on both sides and open enough to be fully challenging in a healthy, positive way because you you build trust too when you're like this. Now, as I continue through the rest of this presentation, I had you earlier thinking about a situation where maybe you were working on a project, but I'm going to ask you to shift gears and now start thinking about times when it's uncomfortable to be assertive. I know for many people that's in candid, high-stakes conversations. So keep a scenario like that in mind so that what I'm offering to you, you can contextualize it. You can see it actually in, in ways that you might use it. Um, I gave you an infographic there in the attachments and links that's all about candid conversations. It's going to go beyond what I talk about here, but if that scenario resonates with you, then feel free to take that infographic too. Okay, now, when we are uncomfortable in a situation like a candid conversation, especially if we've been ambushed and didn't have a chance to really prepare for that conversation, there's something physiological that happens. So it's not just you. This is happening to everybody. And it's not just in your mind. It's real. What you're experiencing, what you're feeling, it's real. So I do want to spend a moment talking about where your reactions, especially in stressful situations, where they come from. Because as humans, we are built all wrong for handling stressful situations with candor and with confidence. We're not designed, physiologically that is, we're not designed to be assertive. Our emotions work against us, and this real physiological response kicks in too. It's all perfectly normal, so we need to expect it and work through it rather than, than letting those feelings derail us. So let me tell you what's going on inside of you. I'm, I'm going to make this really oversimplified, forgive me. But um, what's going on inside you is this. Your adrenal glands automatically begin pumping adrenaline into your bloodstream. And, and this is at that moment when you feel ambushed or you realize something's going to be, uh, uh, tension is, is going to happen or you're fearful of the response somebody else might, might have. Right? So your adrenaline starts pumping. And at the very same time, your brain begins diverting blood from activities it deems non-essential to the higher priority functions like running or hitting. But the large muscles of the arms and legs get more blood and the higher level reactions of the brain get less blood. So basically you're going into this candid conversation feeling like arguing or like running away because that's what your body is signaling for you to do. That's the fight or flight response. And as I said, this is especially true if you're ever caught by surprise. You might feel especially defensive when you feel attacked or ambushed. Basically, that's physiologically at least the modern day version of encountering a, a saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> Your internal protective programming, it responds the same way. And you don't reason through that physiological response until you come across as being combative or defensive. So what do you do? In those moments when the blood has been diverted from your brain and you are 
actually not as intelligent as you otherwise would be. In that moment, when you feel this physiological response, the first thing to do to be more assertive, to get your needs met and to meet the needs of others, the first thing to do is to take a deep breath. Slow, steady breathing tells your adrenal glands to knock it off. And it helps your body to get that blood back into your brain so that you reduce this fight or flight response. So a few deep breaths. I like to ask somebody a question or two. They don't know that I'm deep breathing and freaking out inside my head, but I'm, I'm buying time when I ask a question or two. Even if they're worked up, what they're saying is likely to upset me, I still want to use that time so that I can engage in the conversation in a way that's going to be effective for me, not just merely responsive to them. That's how I get control back. So do that first. Tame the physiological response. That way you'll be able to be more assertive and more effective, more in control of any situation. Now, there are some barriers. I I, I know. (laughs) I know that in addition to handling our fight or flight response, there are some other barriers that we may have to deal with. So I've put those on screen. These are, these are some of the most common obstacles to asserting yourself. And you'll notice that many of these can be minimized by developing confidence. You develop confidence by becoming more assertive. We talked about that loop already. So the good news is that these barriers over time won't seem as big and won't be as real as they are right now. Now, if you're looking at those items on screen, you're probably thinking of some actual barriers, some real situations that you've encountered, the feelings or the perceptions that held you back. Maybe you didn't have a candid conversation. You didn't say everything you needed to say because of one of these items listed, because you perceived a power imbalance. The boss's boss is not somebody I should talk back to, maybe you thought, or those emotions, mine or the other person's, those are those are intense emotions. It's just easier to be passive or it's easier to be aggressive and, and respond to those emotions. Maybe you're not alone if it's if this is true for you. Maybe you just want to be liked. You don't want to rock the boat. You don't want somebody to hold it against you that you didn't agree with them. You don't want people to see you as someone who is aggressive or uncooperative. And so more often you're accommodating or or deferential. Just remember that one of the things we all like best about people is when they are assertive. We all gravitate to people who are confident, who state their needs without stepping on the needs of other people. So the simultaneous piece is what makes us liked, understanding and stating that I have needs and understanding, recognizing and and working to get your needs met too. That's assertiveness. All of these reasons are things that can be addressed. None of these are inherent, hardwired characteristics of an individual. So the first of them are all things that you can work on. The last one, lack of trust or being in an unsafe environment, if, if that is true, not just perceived to be true, But if that is true for you, if you are in an environment where you know people get heavily penalized for asserting themselves, well, that's a different solution. That um, might be a situation where you want to look elsewhere or find ways to, to address that because that's just not sustainable. It's not healthy. It's not good for you. It's not good for the environment, the other people in it or the organization either one and I understand that we do a lot of this work by the way Um, people first productivity solutions work in all the people parts of the business and one of the things we do uh, are team interventions when environments are are really not putting people first so if if that's the situation that you're experiencing um, shoot me an email give me a call later we should talk more about okay let's talk about ways that you'll know if you're not being assertive you'll recognize that you are not being assertive if you're not maintaining objectivity. You're only thinking about the other person's needs and you're not objectively balancing them with your own. 
or you're only thinking about your own needs and you could care less in this moment about somebody else's needs. That's the reminder to you that you're about to be something other than assertive. Now, it's also not assertive if you're using some of these techniques. Think about that candid conversation again. If you hear yourself blaming or shaming someone, if you start to use superlatives like you always or you never, if you aren't able to be specific in that conversation, giving examples, talking about what's concrete, right? if you're doing any of those things, you're not being assertive, those three are telling you that you're probably being aggressive. You're probably not being entirely rational. You're coming on very strong. And you're not being assertive. You Probably you're being passive. If you beat around the bush, you don't really get to the heart of the matter by speaking directly to someone. Or if you're minimizing or apologizing, you know, saying things like, gosh, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I, I just wanted to let you know if, it's probably just me. Right? Those kinds of statements are taking away from the ability the other person will have to understand the point you're trying to get across. And if you don't say anything at all, Maybe you justify it by saying you want to protect somebody from the truth. Well, that's not very nice. You wouldn't want to be protected from the truth if everybody else knows this truth. You ought to have a shot to know what people are thinking and and address it to make it better. So give people what you would want. Don't protect them. Don't be so nice, so passive that you cause people to have problems longer term or bigger than they otherwise would be. It's also if your message isn't clear. Whatever you need, you should state that clearly and completely. That's the only way people can understand it, and it's the only way people can take the steps needed to provide what you need. So be clear. It's okay to be clear, so long as you're not stepping on other people. Make it um, a collaborative, mutual exchange. Here's what I need. What do you need? How can we make sure all of our needs get met? That's what we're looking for here as we're being assertive. Now, I'm giving you another big chart, lots to look at here. What I've attempted to do in this case is give you some specific examples of what it looks like. This is for self-diagnostic. This is for uh, coaching others that you might coach. It's for really trying to to dial into what does it look like. What you see are the examples. Now, in this case, I've just lumped a sort of all together, independent or leader. It's all falling in this column. But you see a passive-aggressive assertive. And in the first uh, row here, these are behaviors. What does it look like? What do the behaviors look like of being passive? You know you're being passive if you don't say what you feel. Um, You're apologizing when you express yourself. You're denying that you disagree with others, right? All of those signal passivity. The contrast is if you are too aggressive, you're viewing what others want as unreasonable or stupid and you're dismissive and you're ignoring, maybe you're even insulting them. That's not effective either. What does it look like to be assertive behaviorally? It means that you are expressing your needs. You're sharing your feelings. You're not assuming that only you are correct and you're not assuming others will agree, allowing space for others to also say what they want and to express how they feel. And it's safe. It's safe for other people to do that. Now, I think this is a good place to answer a question that's been posted here because this is um, something that comes up a lot. Uh, The question is, how do you respond? How do you communicate? How do you get a better relationship with a boss who displays traits that are not assertive? And this person went on to say that it drives me crazy when they're not clear. So whether your boss is someone who is overly passive or your boss is overly aggressive, the way to deal that with that is to, to manage up. You want your boss to be assertive, and you do that by setting the example. You do it by asking questions assertively. When your boss is overly passive and won't say what they want, they, they beat around the bush maybe, you ask a question that forces them to be assertive. You say something like, I really want to be sure I get this right, and I I want to understand. Um, If you wouldn't mind, please just state exactly. Give me a concrete, specific example, 
so I can aspire to do exactly what you're asking me to do. And you might have to ask questions like that in a couple of different ways, with a neutral tone of voice. But you have a right. You, you really do have a right to demand specifics and examples so that you can be successful. And if your boss is overly aggressive and is coming across in a way that, that is intimidating, at a moment when the emotions are maybe less charged, assertively, you might be able to say, hey, I wanted to talk with you when emotions are not running high. I wasn't sure I understood what you are looking for, your needs and our needs, my needs also get met. Can we talk about this? Can we do this a little bit more collaboratively? I got the headline, but I, I want to be sure it's, it's all compatible and, and aligned. So if it's safe, I will put that caveat in there. You can set an example and you can be assertive even with a boss who isn't. Great question. Thank you for that. Okay, this next row, that first one was about behaviors. This next one is about nonverbals. So what does it look like when someone's being passive? They, they look down. They don't have a lot of eye contact. They sort of roll in on themselves. Uh, they might try to be speaking softly and, and making themselves look small. Someone aggressive is doing the opposite. They have big gestures. They're wide open. They try to look a little bit bigger. Their voice is louder. And when you're assertive, your body language, your nipples, is that you're more relaxed. You're, you're more casual. You keep it neutral, and that's because it's not about you. It's about you and the other party or parties. So, of course, it's just going to be more relaxed. Okay, third row is about beliefs. What do you believe? Third row is about emotions, and the fifth row is about goals. I think I will go ahead and take each one of those. Um, looks like we've got time to do that. I'll, I'll go through them pretty quickly, but I see some questions coming in. Keep posting those for me. I'll make sure I get to them at the end, if not sooner. The third row is about beliefs. And I'm not judging any of these, by the way. I think there are reasons why people are any of these three things, passive, aggressive, or assertive. Um, I don't mean to cast aspersions on any of these. I just know that being assertive is more often the way to be more effective. Okay. Beliefs in the third row, when you are in passive mode, you are believing or at least projecting that you believe that other people's needs are more important than your own. You're believing or suggesting that they have rights that you don't have. And it appears that you think their contributions are more valuable and yours are, by contrast, yours are worthless, so you don't contribute them. If you believe that, you certainly don't want to signal that. Your passive actions cause others to think that's what you believe. So be really careful here. The aggressive person is just the opposite. They believe their needs are more important, maybe the only important ones, and that what they have, the rights they have, the positions they have, you don't have any of that. Only they are entitled to them. They believe that their contributions are the ones that matter and that other actions are easily dismissed. They're, they're just not valuable. Okay, getting back into the middle, to be assertive, your needs are equal to my needs. You have a, an equal right to express yourself, as do I, and we both have something valuable to contribute. That's what we want to enter into with our beliefs and our mindset, and that's what we want to signal with our behaviors. Uh, so if you want people to see you in that way, your body language and your behaviors in the top two rows will have to get in line with what you believe. Otherwise, people won't know. Emotions. Now, what you feel and what you express can be two different things. And I say that because your emotions aren't always the best thing to express in a given situation. That doesn't mean that your emotions aren't valid. It doesn't mean your emotions aren't important. It just means that your emotions might not be serving you well. Don't let your emotions manage you. You're going to manage your emotions and choose when and how to put them out there for the rest of the world. So emotionally, someone who's assertive, I'm going to start on the right-hand side, someone who's assertive feels positive about themselves, feels positive about the way they treat other people, has a good sense of self-esteem as they interact with others because of this assertiveness and this confidence that comes from it. 
people who aren't assertive might be being driven by emotions. If it's aggressive, maybe it's angry, powerful, desire to win kinds of emotions. If it's someone who's passive, maybe the emotions are more about uh, well, either feeling frustrated because nothing ever seems to change or feeling helpless because they've never been heard or having a low sense of self-respect and confidence that comes from a fear of rejection. So even if you feel that, though, I want to point out that you can make choices in the behavior columns and in the nonverbals columns that will cause others to see you differently. And when they see you differently, maybe their reactions will cause you to develop some different emotions. Last but not least, the goals of being passive are to avoid conflict. The goals of being aggressive are mostly around winning at any expense. And the goals of being assertive are about having a mutually satisfying outcome. We both win. We both get what we want. We're collaborating. Might be a little harder to get to that point, but because we want that, we'll, we'll make it happen. Okay, well, how do you prepare yourself if you want to be more assertive? You can prepare yourself in a variety of ways. If it's challenging for you to gear up for asserting yourself or, or your position, then these steps could help you to get mentally prepared. If you sometimes cross that line of seeming too aggressive, then these very same tips can help you to prepare for a conversation that, that's going to be more effective. Now, to overcome these barriers, you, you want to practice. I suggest that you practice in a specific upcoming conversation. Go right through the steps. Make sure you know the purpose, the reason you're having that conversation. Identify your own emotional triggers. What might cause me to let this go awry? What might cause the other person to have an emotional reaction? Check your assumptions. Go into it with an open mind and a, a desire, a goal, to get your needs and the needs of the other party understood and met. Organize your thoughts and consider that, that other perspective. And then try to use we and I statements more often than you use you statements, which always sound accusatory and cause people to feel defensive. And if you have trouble with conversations like this, or if you want someone to practice with, consider, consider getting a coach. Give me a call. I'll, I'll spend a few minutes on the phone with you for free. But um, get a coach. Get someone who will help you work through these things. I also gave you an attachment. It's a link to another webinar that I did on this channel. That one's called Using Your Voice, and it's uh, actually one of our most popular webinars. We get lots of on-demand views on that one, so help yourself to that too. Now, you're going into this conversation. Here are the things you can say assertively to set the tone for that conversation. This is going to make it safe so the other party doesn't shut down. You're going to assert yourself. You're going to say, hey, I'd like to discuss X, Y, Z. And I'd like to start by understanding your point of view. Right? We can listen because we have this need to understand their position too. We can listen first and, and use that law of reciprocity so that people will listen to us too when it's our turn. Maybe you could say, hey, you know what? It occurs to me, I, we have different perceptions about this. I'm interested in, in learning more about what you're thinking. Any neutral statement that sets it up so that you're clearly going to state your position and evidently you're, you're interested in hearing the other person's position too, but those are good conversation starters. And you'll keep yourself from getting too aggressive. You'll keep your aggression in check. You'll avoid the perception that you are being aggressive if you take these simple steps. Right? Just inquire with an open mind, like those opening statements gave you an opportunity to do. And let people know. Make sure it's true. And then let people know you've heard their position and you understand where they're coming from. That does not mean you agree with them. It means you heard them. And then without attacking their position, this is not but. It's not you're wrong. It's not you jumped in and interrupted and trampled all over what they said. But after you've heard the other person's position, instead of but, it's and here's how I'm looking at it. And you state your position, you advocate for it without attacking the other party. And then you get to a place where you say, you know, so I, I get how you feel and here's how I'm feeling. So how can we pull this together in a way that's going to be mutually satisfying for both of us? 
And if that process breaks down at any point, maybe the other person gets aggressive, then you go back to step one. Okay, I see there's a lot of uh, emotion around that point. Help me understand. Give me a little more context here. The more you seek to understand, the more people will want to understand you too. That's how you become more assertive. Ultimately, being more assertive makes you more effective, makes you better able to accomplish what you want to accomplish, and gives room for other people to accomplish what they want to accomplish too. So in summary, I'm just going to leave you with uh, some ways to be assertive. These are the habits that you're looking for in that assertive column. Here are the habits that give you the opportunity to be more assertive. I gave you the slides as a download, so I'm going to encourage you to take this one at a minimum. These are things that we've mostly talked about. The other ones are pretty self-explanatory. I hope this has been helpful. I hope that you'll sign up for other webinars that have been posted here. In fact, I've just posted all the ones for 2020. And I hope that you'll subscribe to this channel because I'll also be doing some live video and uh, subscribers will get notifications about those videos going out on this channel. I'm Deb Calvert. My company is People First Productivity Solutions. I'd love to be in touch with you. I hope you will link in with me over on LinkedIn and that you'll let me know if there's anything else I can do to help you out as you look to become more assertive.